right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ariel Rivers, NECD's Director of Membership Engagement, and I will facilitate this one hour NECD Urban and Community Conservation Webinar. In today's webinar, we'll learn from two past grantees through NACD's uh, Urban Agriculture Conservation Grant Initiative. Uh, thank you to everyone who's joining us today. We will record the webinar, post on NACD's YouTube for future access. Please share widely with your networks and anyone who may be interested in seeing this or previous presentations. Please keep yourselves muted for the duration of our presentations. We'll uh, have multiple speakers followed by a question and answer session. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat box throughout the presentations. And during the question and answer period, we'll read them out loud to capture them for the recording. Now I'd like to introduce Ron Rohal uh, to provide a few introductory comments. Ron is chair of NECD's Urban and Community Conservation Resource Policy Group, which is part of our National Resources Policy Committee. Ron. Hey, thank you, Ariel, and I welcome all of you to the monthly Urban and Community Conservation Webinars offered by the National Association of Conservation Districts through the support of our sole sponsor, the Scotts Miracle Grow Company. These sessions are designed by NACD's Urban and Community Resource Policy Group, a subcommittee of district officials and partners charged with guiding the association's services and support for districts' work in developed and developing areas. Our goal through these webinars is to help districts share what they are doing nationwide and enable them to learn from each other and various agencies and organizations. We appreciate the support of the Scotts Miracle Growth Foundation for making them possible. I invite you to let us know what you think about each webinar and what other topics you would like us to cover by contacting NACD staffer, Ariel Rivers. And please tell our NACD leadership what type of assistance you would like from your national association for your urban and community conservation work. And now I'll turn it back over to Ariel for the introduction of our speakers. All right, great. Thank you, Ron. Welcome. All right, so now I would like to introduce our speakers. Uh, today, we will hear from several individuals from Prince George's County Soil Conservation District. We have Kim Rush Lynch, Steve Darcy, and Joseph Hamid. Their district is not only a great supporter of NACD and our events, but they're also a two-time UAC grantee and have a very robust urban and community conservation program. We'll also hear from Erin McClish-James, who managed a 2021 uh, Urban Ag Conservation Grant at Jefferson County SWCD in Kentucky. Erin is very thoughtful in how she approaches her work in urban ag and community conservation, working to support the underrepresented in her community, and will share some key insights from her time working on the grant. So with that said, I'd like to uh, ask each of you when you start to introduce yourselves, and we'll start with Prince George's. So Kim, please feel free to get going and share your screen. Thank you so much, Ariel. And we are so excited to be here again, um, you know, talking about another grant from NACD. So we really appreciate your support. Let me get my PowerPoint straight here. All right. And let me, you guys are seeing my notes right now, I take it. Looks good, looks good. Okay. You actually just saw the presentation, Kim. Oh, that's weird. Mm -hmm. It just left me. <laughs> okay, are we good? Yeah, looks good. All right. So again, I'm Kim Rush Lynch and I am joined today with Mr. Steve Darcy and Mr. Joseph A. Hamid. Very excited to present with them today, our urban farm incubator at Watkins Regional Park. Uh, growing new foods and farm, or growing new farms and good food in Prince George's County. And I wanted to first start off with why an incubator farm is so important. Um, we were very fortunate in our county to have a variety of urban ag legislation passed to allow urban farming in basically now all zones in the county. And we're also very fortunate to have a wonderful resource, EcoCity Farms, who runs a beginning farmer training program. But one thing that they discovered over the years is that they were graduating farmers, but then they had no place to actually farm. They were lacking the land and infrastructure. So we're going to talk a little bit today about this journey that we've taken with these wonderful partners, and we're going to talk about them um, throughout the presentation as well. I'll get to them in a moment. Um, and so some of the barriers that EcoCity Farms found were land, infrastructure, markets, knowledge, and capital. 
Um, and ECO was working on, you know, the knowledge piece and, of course, the markets piece, um, you know, with their farmers. Um, but the land infrastructure and capital were still tough nuts to crack. Um, and thankfully, through a lot of programs lately with USDA and, you know, various state programs, um, this is becoming, um, there's more resources being put in this area. Um, but it's still challenging for urban farmers and beginning farmers in general to begin. I also wanted to say that this project was not only supported by the stakeholders that we're going to talk about today, but also just by our county planning um, department and our just county in general. So urban agriculture and agriculture were both mentioned um, in our Prince George's County Food Security Task Force, um, specifically as you know recommendation to mitigate food insecurity. Also mentioned in our climate action plan um, as a way to mit uh, mitigate the effects of climate change in the county. And then back in 2012, there was a study done um, by our planning department on urban ag and you know how it could benefit the residents in the county from an economic development as well as a health perspective. Um, so we've already been setting the stage over the last couple of years, um, you know, for this project and have gotten buy-in from various agencies in the county as well as our county leadership. I also wanted to mention that food insecurity rates in the county um, went from like 14 and a half percent to almost 17 percent during the pandemic and over 50 percent of um, households with children are SNAP eligible. Um, so it's really imperative that we figure out ways to um, you know, mitigate food insecurity in our county and get more folks growing food for their communities. Um, the next thing that I wanted to mention is this wonderful parcel that we have, this wonderful resource in Watkins Regional Park. It's very central uh, to the county and it's located on a fairly major road. Um, there's a walkway, uh, like a nice trail that goes against up against the incubator farm. And we have this, you know, main, for, uh, main thoroughfare that goes right into the park. Um, the park also has a community garden and you'll see the star is where our urban farm incubator is located and the community garden is right next to it. There's also a school and community center next door, as well as a bee collective. Um, so there's a lot of great resources really in this centralized park that's a, a really a premier, premier venue in Prince George's County. So I just wanted to you know, make sure I mentioned that. Um, the partners that have been involved in this grant are Prince George's Food Equity Council, who's really been helping with advocacy as well as evaluation of programs and some of our grants that we're you know, working on with Eco City Farms, such as the USDA um, Urban Ag and Innovative Production Grant, which we'll talk about. The capital market is, is pledging to help with aggregation and distribution. So they're going to be um, purchasing product from some of the farmers at the incubator farm and then selling it at their farmer's market. Um, and it's a farmer's market that takes uh, Maryland market money, which is a program that um, doubles the value basically of purchases up to a certain amount for those who are receiving SNAP and other uh, federal nutrition assistance benefits. Um, park and planning, of course, the crux of this, they're providing the parcel. Um, they lease over 1,200 tillable acres, and we're going to learn a little bit more about some of their ag leasing programs later in the program. Of course, EcoCity Farms, who has the technical know-how and already has two urban farms in Prince George's County, this was a natural for them to um, progress to this parcel to really um, provide a place for their partner uh, for their farmers. And of course, us, the Prince George's uh, Soil Conservation District. So these are some of the proposed project elements that we've been working on um, on this 11 acre parcel. You know, we've talked about having half acre plots. Um, we wanted a heavy use area with access rows and the heavy use area would house um, potential storage. Um, in this case, shipping containers, which you'll see a little bit later, um, as well as an area for a eventual compost facility. It's a place for shared equipment and tools. Um, we're going to have, you know, well and irrigation. Uh, Steve and Joseph are going to talk about that in a little bit. A deer fence, shared high tunnel and nursery space. Um, of course, we wanted a pollinator habitat and eventually a food forest or orchard will be integrated into that. Um, obviously, our soil and water conservation planning and practices are a critical element to this, as you'll see throughout the presentation. Um, we're working on cold storage. Eco is right now working on cold storage, a wash pack station. Um, we're working with them on some of the discharge elements for that. Um, eventually a produce stand and some sort of pavilion or structure that could be a gathering space or a classroom space. And of course, other things that will occur at this location is an opportunity for cooperative sales, as I briefly mentioned with the capital market, and there'll be others as well, mentoring, and then access to, you know, on-site workshops right there, hands-on workshops. 
So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Steve to talk a little bit about our history with NACD and the wonderful programs that you guys have um, provided us. Excellent. Thank you, Kim. So for those of you who do not know me, my name is Steve Darcy. I'm the district manager of Prince George's Soil Conservation District located in the great town of Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Woohoo! Um, so I've been here for quite a while, and uh, this is such a new and exciting uh, program for me. I'm, my background is production agriculture, and uh, back in the 2010 to 2015 range, I started kind of learning more about and hearing more about urban ag, and then I met Kim, and of course, I've known Joseph for many years, and started hearing about the great things in Baltimore City, and then the 2012 publication about urban ag. So we said, gee whiz, you know what? Here's a whole new customer base that I think we could offer technical assistance to. And by golly, we were right. Um, this thing has really grown. We applied for our first um, grant with NACD um, in 2017, and we started our program. That was a one-year contribution, um, I mean, capacity building grant, and we hired a, ret uh, a retired um, N NRCS um, district conservationist. He ran the program. Kim got very much involved, reached out to all of our stakeholders when we wrote the grant. Stakeholders like MDA, USDA, University of Maryland Extension, NRCS, um, EcoCity Farms, and the Food, uh, Food Equity Council. Um, and so then we were able to convince our local um, county council and our um, local um, county exec's office that we needed a new position. We were lucky enough to get that approved, and we started. So then we hired Kim on as full-time to administer the program, and here we are today. The, the, the goals of that first grant were kind of simple. We wanted to kind of fashion it after our traditional mission of working with landowners and doing soil and water conservation plans, but it was a little different in an urban environment. So we, we kind of branched out in our soil and water conservation plans. We started to provide uh, soil testing for fertilize, uh, fertility and heavy metals. We partnered with USDA um, with a um, um, analyzer um, to check for heavy metals. We're advising these landowners our permitting and zoning and especially utilities like underground and, and overhead utilities, providing um, training for urban ag producers, and most importantly, assisting them with the process of going through NRCS to get EQIP funds. So that kind of brings us up to today. Our second NACD urban ag conservation grant that we got in 2021, we figured we're going to push this right into our project that Kim has been talking about, our incubator farm. And it has really been a wonderful experience to work with all these great partners, um, connecting the urban farmers to the land and, and partners like Maryland National Capital Park and Planning, EcoCity Farms, um, NRCS and MDA. They have all put in in-kind um, uh, resources uh, into this um, into this project. We also signed up for a three-year contribution agreement with USDA and NRCS. And on certain identifiable deliveries, we get paid money for that. Our goal is to raise enough money to get um, electric vehicle for a Kim's program. We think that'll be the next logical step moving forward. Um, it seemed like a natural partnership as we build on our soil health badge uh, partnership with EcoCity Farms and their beginning farmer training program. Um, and so our project funding, um, Maryland National Capital Parking and Planning, as Kim mentioned, provided the land. They've also put in a lot of capital into this project, uh, deer fencing, um, excavation and um, heavy use for heavy use area, access road around the site, a lot of staff time, equipment, and, and materials for implementing the conservation practices that we recommended. They also put in, I don't know how many thousands of feet of underground piping, 
Uh, they drilled a six inch well for irrigation. They're working on upgrading their electric. Then USDA, they've, uh, we've worked with the Plant Material Center uh, with some TEF and some other pollinator habitat seed. Uh, pro they provided technical assistance with an urban soil conservation soil scientist. And then um, EcoCity Farms, they're providing a full-time farm manager, part-time resource. Uh, they've put in two high tunnels. They're supplying the tools and the supplies, two shipping containers, and other parts of the project. Next slide. And NACD, of course, uh, with the grant. Uh, we're providing soil testing, a compost, we purchased cover crop seed, fertilizer, we built um, grass waterways. Um, we also were able to purchase a BCS tractor with some attachments. And um, I think there's a picture there to the right showing that uh, equipment working in one of the high tunnels. We also were able to contract uh, with several con different contracts for implementation and maintenance of conservation practices. One of the things that EcoCity did not realize is how much grass is associated actually with a, a farm. <laughs> and so we were able to contract with a local minority contractor to provide that service. As and that, and that gives them some idea of what it really is going to cost um, if they don't want to do the work themselves. So, how did we get started? Next slide, Kim. First thing we did is we identified a site. Uh, then our technicians and planners went out and walked the site, and we identified uh, certain aspects of the site that needed to be addressed. As you can see from the topography, it drained from the top right to the lower left. So our, our technicians designed two waterways, I mean, one large waterway down through the center, two diversions, and then we have nine half acre plots. Um, and each plot has a 10, a, a 10 foot wide grass bulk between them. That's to provide erosion sediment control and also provides an alleyway for the producers to access their plots. We also designed heavy use areas, a parking lot, um, and now we're working on um, a vegetable washing station. Um, and we're also working on micro irrigation. We also planted uh, pollinator habitat in the upper portion of the, of the site. At this point, I'll turn it over to Joseph that will talk more about our conservation practices out on the site. Thank you. Good afternoon. And I tell you, it's, uh, it's great to hear uh, our rehearsal of the, from Kim and from, uh, from Steve on this project and, and the journey that we've been on uh, and getting to the point where, where we're at. And I, myself, I'm, uh, retired from NRCS with the district conservationists here and in the surrounding counties. And I can always say that my favorite logo is how do we expand the tent, you know, to, to include more citizens, citizen tree into conservation and to know who the conservation district is. And being involved with this urban uh, agriculture crusade is a is something that keeps me from retiring, keeps me around a little bit. So the first, uh, Kim, can you hear me? I sure can. Okay, you wanna go to the next, to the first first um, slide? Okay, so we're gonna just highlight uh, very quickly some of the conservation practices that Steve has already mentioned. Uh, one is the, is the fence. And as we, uh, he had mentioned that uh, Maryland Park and Planning, they, invested a tremendous, and this may have been one of the biggest investment they put into this, but there's no way that you're gonna have a successful small uh, farming on, for vegetables, fruits and vegetables, if you don't have something to protect yourself from deer fencing, deer damaging, especially in these urban, urbanizing areas. Uh, the next one was uh, the waterway. Uh, that waterway that was put in was um, 600 feet of, it was 600 feet of diversion, and there was, um, I think it was 1,200 feet of 
of waterway that was put in. Number of challenges, uh, uh, geese damage, timing, getting uh, getting it done at the right time, communication, but uh, it's, it's been successful. We've had to reseed it again, and uh, uh, we're thankful that even with the amount of rain that we've had, um, it's been able to hold and uh, give a real kudos for our technical staff in the way that they designed these, these, uh, this system. And that because one of the biggest issues here with our project is that we try to uh, put in practices that will have minimum amount of required maintenance, because that's something that parking planning really was trying to avoid uh, having as they invested in, into these urban agri agricultural projects. Next, Kim. Water well. So that water well was a water well, pipeline, and seven troughs, seven uh, uh, hydrants, dry hydrants that were put in. And you can see uh, the construction, a uh, uh, lot of uh, success stories, some challenges. Every, every practice had a small challenge that came with it, but it was a growing challenge for us and we were able to be successful with it. Uh, one of the big issues that we ran into was uh, a source of energy, electric. Uh, we weren't able to have the capacity we needed with the existing electorate there. Uh, so we are, they were not able to get electorate for us to get water this, system, this year, but we had to use water from the community garden below. Next. Okay, this is a filter strip, the filter strips and the fill borders. Another uh, good idea from the technical staff to put these systems in give plenty of room for filtration um, uh, over it's almost like uh, like filter like fill strip cropping uh, field uh, planted across the slope uh, leaving a lot of area for um, uh, for getting good vegetation there and uh, be able to uh, capture runoff in, in this field next high tunnel two high tunnels were put in they were 30. Uh, I think 30 by 96 uh, feet wide, feet, uh, feet long, and uh, they work really well. It was a very good quality structure that was put in. Um, uh, they came in and uh, worked very well. One of, one of the high tunnels will be used for uh, being able to uh, do some nursing and uh, nursery crops and putting, uh, putting some stands and tables in. Uh, on the left side is a heavy use area. And let me see how many feet was that? The access road, I'm sorry. The access road was, um, I don't have the actual footage here it was, but one thing to uh, do want to highlight about the access road is a thousand feet that was put in. There was about 400 to 500 tons of asphalt that was brought in between the between the, for both the uh, heavy use area and the access road. A lot of this had to be uh, excavated out, uh, topsoil removed, um, then hauled, all of that hauled in, all that was done by Maryland Park and Planning. Uh, so tremendous work in addition to our technical staff for the design work and oversight. Next, nutrient management. Nutrient management is something that uh, is very important out there. It's, it was a grain field, um, very little organic matter there. Uh, the district was able through the grant purchase um, compost uh, to be brought in. Maryland Park and Planning was able to use their trucks to haul it in. Uh, you can see the A-team on your left of uh, Maryland Park and Planning, the coordinators, uh, Eco Farms, uh, Eco City Farms, their soil scientists and NRCS's soil science team. Uh, one thing we were trying to do is to find a way we can attach this to uh, a soil health demonstration project to see the benefits of uh, the uh, compost and the other adamants that we're going to be doing out there on the site as time goes on. Okay. Nice picture, huh? <laughs> Next one is cover crop. We were very really happy. I, you know, one of the reasons we, uh, you know, one of the setbacks was because we didn't have the water available, um, it, some of the farmers moved a little slower than normal. All of the fields didn't get 
uh, planted on time. So we were able to uh, uh, catch up on some of the site prep, prep sites as far as um, getting more cover crop in. So on the left is some buckwheat that was put in. Some of the farmers put that in and some of the fields that were left open. And also we were able to get TIF in. Uh, some of the farmers did that. And also we worked with the National um, Plant Material Center and they brought their technical team out and uh, helped us in and trying to get some TIF growing out there for cover crop and uh, soil compression, uh, weed compression. Contour farming. Um, I'm not sure whether it was because of the absence of water at the time and the need to use a community garden, but by the time we came out there, one of the farmers had started uh, their rows up and down the hill. And so uh, one big rain came, came and I think it was evident that uh, we didn't have to convince them the need to be able to change those roads. So they changed them and put them all across the slope uh, as close to the contour as, as possible. And you can see the contours in the bottom there. Um, and uh, our technical team did an excellent job of laying this, this place out. Uh, co uh, conservation cover, uh, a lot of the fields that didn't, uh, had three, four, five plots that didn't get uh, farmers for this year. Uh, we're interviewing for them right now. So we're able to keep them under some cover. We had them cultivated, the fields cultivated, try to uh, get rid of some of the, the woody growth that was coming up after being out of production for a few years. And I think we went two years twice where we came in and put uh, conservation cover in, uh, crops put in. Okay, technical assistance. Uh, we were able to uh, work with them on some uh, uh, workshop. This is a picture of the all the farmers for this year. Uh, one of the initial workshops that they had, an introductory um, uh, uh, workshop procedure there. And then we also had NRCS uh, DC that was there helping out with that. On the right is, is our, uh, our great technical staff here in the office, uh, getting their hands dirty and didn't wasn't going to wait on the, the equipment. So they went out and started doing some of the seating, putting some of the buffers in place uh, while we waited on, uh, instead of waiting on equipment to come. And Joseph, if I can add a few things, um, you know, some other things where we had monthly or biweekly stakeholder meetings, you know, with yeah. all of our various stakeholders, as Joseph mentioned earlier, because we had such strong relationships before going into this project, um, it really helped because there were challenges without you know, having to deal with if you didn't necessarily have the correct partners or a good relationship with your partners, which we absolutely did. Um, and the other thing too, is we helped with like the application process. Um, you know, Joseph and I both have, have sat in on interviews um, for the beginning farmers or in the urban farm incubator farmers. Um, so yeah, it was more than just the conservation technical assistance that we provided. Um, looking ahead, um, these are some of the other things I'll just mention quickly that we're looking to do next. I know that um, Eco City Farms is really excited about doing some food waste composting. Um, we're not sure if it's going to work at this particular site, so, but we are investigating some sort of compost facility. We talked about some of these other things earlier, so I won't um, go into that too much. But one of the other things is thinking more about our long term strategy for continued operations of this farm and continued funding sources. I mean, now we just wanted to give you a highlight of just a few of the farmers. Um, first, we have Sisters of the Soil, Miriam, Michelle, and Trinia. Um, they bring a lot of expertise. They were in the beginning farmer training program. Uh, Michelle has farmed for like over 10 years, or not over 10 years, just under 10 years, actually. And, um, you know, they're doing flowers, herbs, and produce. One of them is an herbalist. Um, and so they were one of the first, um, I guess, plot holders for the incubator farm. And then Joseph's going to talk about two other farmers before we wrap up. Yes, this is um, Maya. Maya is uh, new. She's, uh, I interviewed her, but the video didn't come out too well uh, in doing that. But someone read what she had mentioned in her interview. Uh, she said that uh, she was our first corp, uh, in incubator farm participant. And she said, my general education background includes a BA from the University of Maryland, as well as a certificate from culinary art from Prince George's Community College. In regard to farm and agricultural training, I'm currently doing my second year of the beginning 
farmer training program through Future Harvest. I, apprent I apprenticed with at uh, Eco City Farms, both at the Edmondson Farm and the Bladensburg location. And 2016, 2020, 2021, and completed a two day uh, permaculture and, and urban garden course at, at Common, Common Good City Farm. I also completed a two day gap training through the Maryland Department of Agriculture. And additionally, I am I myself as a student uh, of my trade and I'm constantly reading and attending webinars and volunteering at farms to build my knowledge. And uh, Maya, she, she's growing um, veggies and herbs. Uh, she was very quick on helping us to, uh, on trying to introduce tiff and buckwheat into her operation. Uh, she was one of the latter ones to start, but she really took off once she, when she uh, got going. I, I think due to time, Joseph, we're not going to be able to show this clip, but I'll just show a few seconds so they can see Philip, and maybe you could just say a few words about him. Okay. So the next person is Phil. And you know what? It's not going to play. Is that okay? That's no problem. Okay, if you can just talk about it. Is Phil and um, Phil is uh, came in with his wife. His wife had volunteered and worked with, worked over at or volunteered at Eco City Farms, and so he came in through that, and he wind up being one of our bu busiest persons out there on the farm. He came early. He's there all day. I think Phil is retired. He's actually from Haiti. And I think he's doing some collaborative farming uh, uh, in Haiti with small farmers over there. But he's been uh, there on the farm all the time. He's really big on building relationships and, and working with uh, helping the coordinator from Eco Farms coordinator out there with a lot of the infrastructure stuff. Uh, so um, he's a heck of a guy that uh, to be a part of the team. And with that, um, we just want to thank NACD and also USDA NRCS because they provide a lot of funding through the Beginning Farmer Training Program as well as, um, you know, in-kind support um, locally. And uh, there's Steve. He was coming through the incubator farm after a day out, and uh, we stopped by and had to get a picture with him. And you can see um, we've got NACD's logo up on the, the main sign. There's two of those. Yes, yes. This has been really a great project. I really do appreciate uh, all of our supporters and uh, especially shout out to NACD and NRCS. That day I, I was going to go play golf and they sent me a text that the sign was up. So I had to come by and see it. I, that is not my normal office attire. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. Very good. Hey everyone. Kim, your slideshows are always so gorgeous. <laughs> um, that's an okay thing to say. Um, oh my gosh, I haven't done one in so long. Sorry. So you are just seeing my slideshows, right? All right. Cool. Hey everyone, um, I'm gonna give you all the details. Uh, I no longer work for the conservation district. Um, I, after our grant ended, they couldn't afford to keep me because of other factors. Um, I'm here voluntarily today because I really care about this project and I'm trying to move these pieces forward in other parts of um, my life right now by volunteering and incorporating things that I learned throughout this process into my current job. Currently, I'm the guest services supervisor at Jefferson Memorial Forest, which is the largest urban forest in our state. Um, they have a really wonderful traditional environmental education program that's doing a lot of outreach across the county, not just in um, areas that have easy access to green space. Um, but I'm working on, in my job to uh, work on our historical interpretation to help connect some of the pieces uh, in our community because as we know, what happens uh, in agriculture happens in nature and vice versa. And so really I'm working to start tying these pieces together. Um, this all started because I had the luxury of being in the Wade 
about something instead of oppressed by something. Um, I went to, before we applied for this grant, I went to um, a Kentucky Department of Agriculture meeting. It was right before COVID started and they gave us a bunch of resources, which is really great. Um, except that some of them were basically glorified advertisements such as for dairy. Um, but no, there was nothing in there that was talking about, uh, they would really go on and on about Kentucky's rich agricultural history, but they wouldn't tell the whole story of Kentucky's agricultural history, which we will get to in a moment. Um, the gardens that we would, that other folks before me would put in at our, at our, um, uh, public schools were getting mown down regularly, which isn't unique, but I felt like it was something that we could think about. Uh, and so this grant helped us experiment with some things that we're hoping work. Um, and then it was also about just generally my community's fear of historical accuracy. <laughs> um, we uh, in Kentucky grew up with, I am 40. So when I was in school in the eighties and nineties, we learned a very different narrative about Kentucky's history, specifically as it pertains to uh, land theft from indigenous people and enslavement, which I'll get to in a moment. Uh, the issues for the school gardens um, is that when those spaces get mown down, it demoralizes students because they've trusted us that they could make a difference and it didn't even last a year, right? Um, and the barriers to that were for our county was that the people who are mowing the spaces are not the same people who are in the building the rest of the week. Their contract, they're often coming from out of town. And so they don't have any connection to those spaces. Um, their one job is to mow down the weeds. And if they perceive it as being a weed, they're gonna walk past the sign that says this is a pollinator space and they're gonna take the weed whacker to it. We saw it time and time again. And so one thing that we wanted to do was figure out a way to create a physical barrier that wasn't a fence. Um, because a fence keeps everybody out, right? We just want to keep the mower out. We want the kids to know that they can approach these spaces and engage them without it being too threatening. The other issue, which I just talked about, is all of the curriculum is sort of glossing over the unpleasant parts of our history, land theft, and the forced labor of enslaved Africans. And they were relegating that to the social studies classes, sort of. Um, instead of telling the whole story. And we, if we're going to make change, we have to, we have to start bringing these ideas together because who wants to and who can historically access space matters. That story matters to who can get into those spaces now. Um, and we also just needed more physical spaces in which to have conversations about the history that I should have been taught in my K through 12 experience. Um, which was pretty whitewashed. Um, so there are a lot of what we call self-selecting adults um, who need to go back and have some lessons and we needed a space to make that happen. Um, why does this matter? Um, history repeats itself. If people don't, uh, if we don't change the story and let people know that they can make a difference, we'll continue to live in these patterns of destruction. Not only destruction of the land, but destruction of people's lives through uh, systemic excuse me, through systemic um, biases and um, borders to access. Oh, are you going to go? Um, history also repeats itself if nobody's talking about it. As soon as Europeans find their way through the Cumberland Gap, big agriculture started in Kentucky, which I, even in the course of, you know, getting ready for this, learned about six months ago. Um, the salt licks, which are hearing, were prevalent here in Kentucky, are really what enabled folks to stick around um, because we can now preserve food, but also means that um, there's dangerous work that needs to be done um, and people want to outsource dangerous things. What are we, you know, what are we seeing right now with the Union Pacific Railroads um, strikes, except that they're tired of having really difficult work put on them that's in an unfair way. Um, so I'll tell you what I uh, learned growing up about land theft and enslavement. And if you feel like compelled to roll your eyes as someone who's not from Kentucky, I support you in doing that. Um, I learned growing up that, you know, yeah, I mean, there may have been sub slaves in Kentucky, but we really weren't into that whole thing. We are a neutral state, which wasn't the case. Um, we also learned in terms of indigenous people that uh, no one was here 
right? This myth that you're hearing about it being the dark and bloody ground and like nobody wanted to be here um, is a misquote of a chief who's, um, who was being forced into a treaty. And he was not talking about his history uh, in this land. He was talking about what had happened post-contact. Uh, and so these stories get told and told to justify the land theft, the way this land was being used by indigenous people appeared passive to Europeans because they were using the salt licks to manage how the bison and the bigger game was moving through. And so they would burn fields to make sure that the bison, when they came through, could get to those salt licks because we know they, you know, you can't, it's bison are enormous anyway, but if you can count on knowing where the game is going to be, you want to do that. And if you don't have to bring the food to them, they're going to get their own food and you can just count on when they're going to be here. That makes a lot of sense. Um, this narrative continuing means that we are blind to these historic barriers and ultimately, um, sorry, this is blocking my view, uh, around the need to protect green space as sacred space, um, the inequalities of land access and the systemic drivers of injustice in food systems. So it means if we continue to allow these narratives um, to be taught, we are not going to see a reason to increase equity um, and push for food sovereignty. There we go. So what did we try? Uh, we did three pollinator gardens across our county um, to see what worked and what didn't. Uh, we knew that we wanted to do um, raised beds that were metal, uh, that were ADA height, uh, because it's really hard to run over that with a mower. Uh, that was basically it. So we bought, um, those beds for each school, filled them with dirt. Our dirt got donated. Uh, I kind of love telling people this. Our dirt was donated from Cave Hill Cemetery, which sounds awful uh, uh, to middle schoolers when you tell them I'm here to say. Um, but I really loved the idea that this dirt that was procured out of someone else's sorrow is now being put into these pollinator gardens, which are going to, when combined with compost appropriately, um, help life flourish you know what I mean so that was really beautiful and eventually those middle schoolers did come around to the idea uh, we also partnered with uh, Farmington Historic Plantation there are four I didn't know this when I was growing up either there are four plantations uh, in Louisville which is Jefferson County Louisville the same thing uh, and they're all part of what's called the Louisville Coalition on the History of the Enslaved uh, they are a group of folks who are recognizing what I call uh, terrorism, meaning Terra from Gone with the Wind, this idea that plantations are this glorious thing that we should be really proud of. Um, they're pushing it back against that narrative and telling, telling the true story and they're using their spaces differently than um, a lot of plant, other plantations in other places. And it's a privilege to be part of that work because we're all learning together um, and we're all really open to understanding that we're going to get it wrong sometimes, but using the most data we have to do the best job we can. So what we wanted to do at Farmington was uh, create a demonstration space. So with our community partners who are um, the Jefferson County Master Gardeners Association, uh, who brought a ton of planning and um, other partnerships with them to help pay for things, which is great because when I worked for the conservation districts for a long time, uh, it was me and one other part-time employee. When I see your all pictures of like a whole team of folks, I'm a little bit jealous and maybe a little misty eyed, um, but I think we did, we did a good job with the partnerships that we had. Uh, our schools, I'll talk about those first. These schools pull from all over the county. So even though they're sort of clusters together along the top edge. They're um, all teaching in different ways. Uh, there's Central and Westport are Montessori schools. And then Miners Lane is pulling from the Southwest corner of Jefferson County, which is often forgot by a lot, forgotten by a lot of folks. Um, I purposely used an older map because in a lot of ways, Louisville is still living in its older thinking. Um, these schools all had to apply and let us know why they thought they would be a good fit. Uh, this is Miners Lane Elementary. Their garden boxes are right out front in front of their school. Um, I didn't have photo releases for all of the kids for Miners Lane, so I don't have any pictures of these adorable humans, but um, our early experiences with them were just talking, getting them used to being outside uh, in a way that wasn't like stabbing each other with sticks. 
Um, they have this really wonderful um, stream that goes around and we spend a lot of time talking about red wing blackbirds and you know, your water is special here, why is it special? Um, and then they started seeing the pollinators as we were having these other conversations and they're going to put in their plants next week, which I'm so excited about. Um, the person in this picture with me, I'm the one in the front with the glasses behind me is one of our board members, Sarah Beth, who is a champion of this project. Um, and you can see the beds, how it'd be really hard to mistake running over these, uh, which was one of our goals. Westport Middle School, uh, that's Sarah Beth's truck where she hauled some dirt in. This is their gar current garden space. You can see our bed in the far top over there. Um, they were really adding to um, something already in progress. And I'm happy to say that they this year are in a position to hire someone to manage a vegetable garden um, full time uh, as a part of another position. So they're gonna have a teacher who is teaching um, uh, it's like a magnet for healthcare to talk about that, but then that position exists to help build up this gardening program from scratch. Their classroom is a kitchen and I don't know who they're hiring for that yet, but I'm super jealous. I wish my classroom was a kitchen. Um, these are more pictures of Westport. Uh, you can see how tall the boxes are and those are the students that are standing in the box, obviously, but are really excited that they got to build this entire thing from scratch. Uh, Montessori programs are a lot of about a lot of hands-on things, um, but they're not often getting dirty and that was kind of novel for some of them. Um, Central High School uh, is they the spot they had that made the most sense was on this forgotten concrete pad. And so I said, okay, let's try it. It was a privilege to say, okay, let's try it a lot because the point was to figure out what works. And um, this is gonna get a lot of students walking past it. And when they get it planted, they've uh, they've changed their, uh, sort of the setup for their school this year to be more like um, the Hogwarts school houses. And so each house is going to have a week where they come and they maintain this garden space. Um, and they're gonna make it a point of pride in their school to make see who can make it look the best, which I love. Um, we are putting the dirt in. Uh, a lot of these students hadn't really had an opportunity to get their hands in the dirt yet either, which I loved. Um, here's historic, Farmington Historic Plantation. Um, Farmington has a very special place in my heart. Uh, their director, Kathy, is so fierce in her insistence upon historical accuracy, and she really fights to uh, not cover things up, which makes her one of my favorite people because we can just be disobedient together. Um, but historically, Farmington was a hemp plant. Now here's why that is significant to this entire conversation. Um, we did not grow cotton in great quantities here in Kentucky. What we did, our contribution to the entire ugly machine was we made all of the rope that wrapped and bailed all of the cotton. So this idea that we would try to say that we weren't a major driving mechanism of the South's history of enslavement is just absurd. Um, here is some, an aerial view of where we uh, marked out the place. Uh, so here along uh, the bottom, you can see these kind of more narrow rectangles. That's where the garden boxes are gonna be. There's another picture. And then those two larger spaces at, up top, um, the one on the right is gonna be a pollinator space. And these are dug out now, this was um, a while ago. These are the boxes that they built. Uh, unfortunately, the price of lumber did a thing before <laughs> before we bought these, um, but they're all ADA. They dug out and put gravel so that um, anyone of any age can come, uh, any age and ability can come and uh, experience these spaces. The agreement we have with the master gardeners, whether I'm doing a program uh, as a volunteer or whether they're teaching them is that no one can do a class about anything. So cover crops, vegetables, any of it without talking about the history of what has historically happened in that place. Um, they're getting trained in the next couple of months on how to have those conversations because they're really difficult for some folks. Uh, they're expecting to come and hear one thing and they're being told another and sometimes it takes some grace to navigate. Um, I take a lot of cues from Joe McGill who is who works at um, Magnolia Plantation in South Carolina 
who has these conversations pretty regularly. Uh, and and I, my goal is not to build enemies, but it's to build bridges, but sometimes it's just not always possible. Um, questions, comments, concerns, sly remarks. Uh, our project was really about setting up a place for others to then come and do the work. I, I kind of saw the writing on the wall and knew that the chances of me being able to be at my conservation district for a number of years wasn't, probably wasn't gonna happen. Our city, when when I saw your all's presentation and was reminded that your city parks were a part of your project, I kind of wanted to cry because we don't have that support here for our conservation districts. Um, I don't know where you all get your funding um, uh, I know every, every, literally every other conservation district in my state gets money from property taxes and in Jefferson County, we don't, um, we it's, and at this point getting, pushing that ball up the hill and getting it through the courts is going to be really hard. Um, we can last year, we, we consistently asked them for about $230,000 to do our work in the County and they keep giving us 113, uh, which is not enough to even staff things. Um, they also, something that was really curious, our government, and I support this, but they started a sustainability sector within the, the government. And I, I work for Metro government now, I actually work in the park system. Um, and we were like, this is wonderful, but we're right here. <laughs> We've been here since 1945. Like we're, we're here and are ready to do this work. Um, there's a new, we're electing a new mayor soon. Um, but we're also, uh, a lot of the board members are up for re-election as well. And so I'm hoping that things get shaken up a little bit and we can do some more fundraising um, because we could really be doing a lot with this. In the meantime, uh, what I'm doing is making sure that these spaces are in good hands. Westport Middle School is in great hands. Um, I've talked to them. I know that whoever they choose to take that on is gonna do a good job because they have secured um, $15,000 a year for this project in perpetuity. I don't know how she did that, but I'm really happy for her. Um, I can't wait to see what happens because two of my kids go to that school. Um, and so I'm trying to find a partner for Minor Slane. Um, I think we are, we're circling the runway on a partner for Central, who is my friend Vaughn Barnes, who runs Kentucky in a Backyard Farms. We'll look him up for sure. He, uh, I don't know how he manages to fit more hours in the day than I do, um, but I feel like he's doing everything. And I'm really, he's one of my favorite community partners for sure. Um, oh, my mom's on you guys. Hi mom. <laughs> um, anybody Hello. have, Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, anybody Hi, have any questions for me? I will actually, so you brought up a, a really good point, Erin, and one that I often like to ask our urban ag grantees when we have an opportunity to come together, and it's how do we sustain these programs over the long, excuse me, long term, and that's something that we consistently see as an issue. We have several other grantees, Stacy, Casey, hi, I see all of you here. So, Steve, with, um, you know, you do have a really great district up there. So I'm wondering if you might be able to provide some additional thoughts. And, and Kim highlighted it as well. The partnerships are so important. But I'd really appreciate hearing some thoughts on and suggestions for other districts, too. Thanks. Um, so, Aaron, I love that presentation. It gives me goosebumps thinking about the history. And, um, you know, I just always thought of Kentucky as tobacco country. So, you know, the slavery issue. I, I never thought about the hemp. That that's that just gives me goosebumps thinking about it. Thank um, you so much. And as history continues, um, the fact that Kentucky made a lot of rope becomes even more chilling. Yeah. Um, I understood. Yeah. Um, I will um, make two recommendations to anyone here who is wants to think more about this. Um, I have a resource that I'm building, it's a spreadsheet and it's got resources divided by kind of region, uh, what the resource is and kind of a summary of it. If anybody wants that, um, email me and I will add you to that. Two that I haven't had a chance to put on there, well, maybe I have one of them. This book um, is uh, Agri Agrarian Kentucky and it is a really great job of giving a high view of how religion and racism and economics and immigration and like what's 
I struggle with the difference between a colonizer and a settler pretty often in my head. Um, it does a good job of kind of laying all that out for us, understanding the history of banks is really tied to an insurance company, pretending it was something else. Uh, it's wild, it's wild. Um, and then the other one is a book that just came out by Emily Bingham called My Old Kentucky Home. Um, as a person from Kentucky, uh, I grew up hearing this the first Saturday in May, uh, basically up there with the national anthem. Uh, and a lot of people don't know the racist history of that song. Um, and so if this is a thing that you're thinking about, even what music continues is, is key to the entire conversation. My big thing is that everything is connected. Um, so yeah, if anyone has I any ideas that I can pass along to our next uh, crop of board members on how to petition for more funding, I will happily pass those along. Um, I would love to work for the district again or somewhere in this field. I'm I love where I am and I know that I can continue this work, but there's nothing really like a a kid taking a, a bite of a carrot that they grew for the first time <laughs> and, and like understanding that there's power in that moment. So Arrow, you asked uh, to comment on some bu budgeting and, and funding. So um, we've, I have talked to many districts and, and staff uh, in the last few years going to NACD meetings. Um, one thing that the soil conservation districts enjoy in Maryland is the Chesapeake Bay. And that is a big money driver. Um, back in uh, the 60s, there was a huge, 50s and 60s in Maryland, there was a huge push for development and with uncontrolled um, erosion sediment. The legislators in their wisdom um, gave soil conservation districts that role to um, review and approve erosion sediment control and grading plans. So anybody anywhere in the state of Maryland, if, if you grade land, uh, disturb land, you have to get an erosion sediment control plan up, reviewed and approved by your local soil conservation district. And with that comes a fee. So we have the ability to generate money that way. Each district, uh, of course, we have a great partnership, a conservation partnership in Maryland with Maryland Department of Agriculture, they, they pump in money and, and resources and people. NRCS, they pump in money, resources, and people. And then our third um, partner is the local government. Now, that's where it changes a little bit for each district. We have enjoyed a very long, um, productive partnership um, and marriage, if you will, with our local government. Um, and they've been very supportive of us, uh, but we're also very supportive of them. If they need something, you know, we're right there to, to help them. So my advice, well, one other big difference is I hear you talk about your supervisors, they're elected. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't like that. We're, we're fortunate. We're not like that. Our, our district supervisors, we have five supervisors. One is appointed by the local county executive two are at large, and then two, one is uh, recommended to the State Soil Conservation Committee from our local Farm Bureau, and one is recommended by our local extension. Um, so, you know, they don't have any skin in the game as uh, someone who is elected uh, would. They, they are just, they sit on the board because they have a true desire to uh, provide locally led soil and water conservation. So that's something, I don't know how you change that, but really the, the short answer to districts getting more funding, you gotta, you gotta be relevant and you gotta get legislation at the local and the state level to support you. That's such a great comment, Steve. And we are coming up right on the hour. So I want to be mindful and respectful, respective of everybody's time. So um, huge thank you again to all of our presenters and um, each of you for sharing heartfelt sentiments as well as your thoughts.
Uh, please keep the conversation open with each other. So like I said, we have multiple other grantees on the line, Stacy, Casey, Betty Jo. Um, all of you have great insight, great thoughts, et cetera. So please uh, let me know how I can be supportive to facilitate ongoing conversations re with regard to not only the historical context in which we're all operating, but also key questions that are going to affect the future of our work, like policy issues, funding, partnerships, et cetera, et cetera. So um, with that said, again, huge thank you to all of our presenters. I'll be sharing around the YouTube and uh, contact information and presentations to everyone as well. So on that note, thank you. And we'll see you all next month, probably. Thanks, Ariel. Thank you. See you, Aaron. Bye. Bye, everyone.